you so much for having me. As Christy said, I'm Natasha Barlow. I am Bird Canada's Boreal Conservation Project Specialist. Thanks to Muskoka Watershed Council for reaching out to our organization. I am really excited for some mutual two-way learning. I just recently, recently purchased a home with my partner, with my husband, and there's a pond on it. And we're fairly new at being homeowners, so we have a lot to learn, but I'm not that new as, at being a bird watcher or a birder. And so I'm hoping that we can kind of take that first step today to bridge that those two worlds, the homeowners and the birders and find out what we have in common. And just a little bit of background to kind of ground you where I'm from. I grew up near Point Pelee National Park in southwestern Ontario. If you haven't been there, it's a huge bird hub. It's a little piece of land that juts out into Lake Erie. And it's one of the first places that birds see as kind of a safe haven as they're traveling across the lake. And so it's a great birding opportunity. Highly recommend going there if you do have a chance. But of course, I did not appreciate it until I moved away, which isn't that how it always goes. It wasn't until my second year of my undergraduate degree that I really realized bird watching is kind of like a scavenger hunt for these beautiful living creatures. And you don't need to be an expert to really appreciate them. And then I completed my master's at the University of Waterloo and now work for Birds Canada and will forever love birds and be typecast forever. But today I'll be giving a general overview of why water features like wetlands, waterways, shorelines, or even small bird baths or ponds on our properties can really be a crucial life-saving resource for so many species that breed in the boreal region of Northern Canada. And I'll be talking about how we are connected to those birds. And even if we don't live in extreme northern Canada areas, I'll give you a few kind of tips and tricks on ways that we can all be involved in their conservation. So without further ado, let's actually get to it. Wetlands, waterways, and water birds, the boreal connection. And so I'm not going to assume that you're, you know what Birds Canada is or who we are. But first and foremost, so we are an environmental, non-government, non-profit organization. We just changed our name from Bird Studies Canada, so maybe you were familiar with us in the past. We really strive to conserve wild birds through many different avenues, whether it's sound science, on-the-ground action, innovative partnership, public engagement, and science-based advocacy. And we do try to be Canada's voice for birds, and that involves all of your voices everywhere from all backgrounds. And my role is really to work to protect and conserve birds like the greater yellow legs, which is on your screen, birds that breed or live in the boreal region of Northern Canada, including during their migration, this long trek to and from their boreal breeding grounds and their Southern overwintering grounds. When some of these species can fly thousands of kilometers, the black hole warbler can fly upwards of 20,000 kilometers round trip in one year. And they're using water features that are on our properties, that are in our neighborhoods, and they're traveling straight through Ontario, all the way sometimes to South America, where many of them might be right now at the end of March, but they're really gearing up right now, putting on some fat storage, eating a lot of food. I wish I could do that too, um, before their trek April and May back to where we are in Ontario. But what is the boreal? And what is this region that I keep talking about? What is this word? So the boreal region, it's one of the biggest biomes on Earth. And a biome is a region that's categorized by the different plants and animals that have formed community assemblages based on the climate of the area. And on the map on your screen, you can see that these are the different forest regions on Earth. And the green area is the boreal forest. And that red circle is US and Canada, well, mainly Canada. The global boreal forest has around 30% of the entire Earth's forested area. It contains more fresh water than any other biome. It has large tracts of unmanaged forests, and it's really only spread across a few countries. And Canada is one of them. You can just visually see in the green how much land area is taken up from the boreal region. And over half of it, over half of Ontario is essentially the boreal region. That's a pretty huge amount. And since we are one of the few countries that have pretty large percentage of the boreal region, we do have a unique experience and an opportunity to protect it and experience it. 
So this region is characterized by high latitude environments, short growing seasons, freezing temperatures, six to eight months of the year, extreme conditions, anything from insect outbreaks to fire to wind blowdowns. And I just recently learned that the boreal was kind of appropriately named, apparently after the Greek god Boreas, which is the god of the north wind and winter. And although the boreal is a forest ecosystem, it's composed of lakes, wetlands, mountains, coastlines. Canada's boreal actually contains 25% of the entire world's wetlands, 197 million acres of surface freshwater. It's a region we know that clearly isn't as populated as others in southern Canada, but in these more extreme conditions lies some pretty interesting nature and birds, which is why I'm here today. So what is migration? Most people can kind of notice that change in spring from winter to spring, a little bit with what we're experiencing now with that warming weather, but also because of the return of these gems of the sky, right? Birds. And as I was saying, many bird species are completing this long distance biannual migration between their southern overwintering grounds and their northern breeding grounds. Billions of individuals are traveling each year to breed in this boreal region, this green area on the map. And anything from water birds to songbirds, some are coming straight through southern Canada. So keep your eyes and your ears out in April and May for these breeding birds that are using your backyards and your local natural areas as they're traveling. And here's just a quick visual example of a bird. It doesn't actually breed in the boreal region, but it uses it as stopover habitat on its way to more northern grounds. This is the red knot. There are a variety of crucial resources used in the boreal, whether they're living there year round, whether it's just migrating habitat, whether it's breeding habitat. And this cute little shorebird, some subspecies are actually endangered in Canada, so they are at risk of extinction. But you can look for kind of its rusty plumage, its clothes in the spring before it transitions to more of that gray muted white in the fall. So the visual data that I'm going to show you is collected from the MODIS wildlife tracking system. And you'll see basically like individual birds flying, which is how we've tracked them on their migration between 2014 and 2016. So if I just go ahead and play this. You can see individual birds in the spring are flying north to Hudson's Bay, and then in the fall are coming back down to the southeast. And so many of these birds, and this is going to be happening very, very shortly for us in the coming months, and other birds as well, shorebirds, birds that spend their time near the shore, appropriately named, or other water birds, birds that spend the majority of their time frequently water. But there's other species as well. Grebes on the top left, sandpipers, ducks, and our classic Canada goose. Horned grebes, for example, on the top left of your screen, they breed in shallow freshwater ponds in the boreal with the virgin vegetation. But during migration, you can see them on larger bodies of water, which is where I see them in southern Ontario. But water features come in many forms, and hopefully you can resonate with at least some of these photos. Maybe they look like an element on your property, maybe a place in your neighborhood, maybe somewhere that you visited. Anything from, you know, treed wetlands to swamps, open lakes, rivers, banks, shorelines. This is actually in Wyoming, <laughs> which I know is not super relevant, but... All of these areas are really, really important to humans, but also to birds as well. Or even things like a small bird bath. We know that they help humans with water retention. They reduce the likelihood of floods. And water is also an important element for entertainment, for sports, for horribly skipping rocks, like I do in this video. Or wildlife watching. This is a muskrat um, that is on was in our pond last year. I am... Not convinced that all of them survived the winter, but I hope to see them soon. But why is water actually important to birds? If you think about the three things that humans need to physically survive, food, shelter, and water, this is equally true for birds and wildlife. And so incorporating a water feature into your outdoor space, it's a really great way to attract more birds to your home regardless of the size or type. Maybe you back onto a lake, maybe you have a bird bath in your urban backyard. These are great features to add to your home. They provide drinking water, bathing locations. 
um, rehydrating as they're making that big migratory trek. But if we think about the other two life-saving resources of food and shelter, water features can actually provide this too for many species. So I have a question for all of you. It's not a quiz, it's just a question. Does anybody here like eating liver and onions? So think about it, honestly, I've never had it. Um, I think I would try it. I don't know if I would prefer it, um, but do you like eating liver and onions? So just think about that and feel free to go ahead and submit your answers to the poll. I'm curious, yes or no, submit your answers. Who likes eating liver and onions? So I've never had it, so I'm just gonna submit that. <laughs> when I asked my partner, my husband, he was uh, not a fan, so no judgment if people respond that they don't like it. And so that is, wow, that's very interesting. I was expecting to see it to be much more targeted towards people not eating liver and onions, but it's pretty much 50-50. So good for you guys. Look at this diversity of food options. Um, but there wasn't as many people who did like eating liver and onions. But can you imagine that if everyone in the entire world only ate liver and onions for every single meal, there would not be enough to go around. So kudos to you guys who do like eating liver and onions. There is still plenty for you. And on a, you know, kind of a bigger scale, this kind of happens in the wild too. Many bird species have evolved over time to select certain, certain things to eat and not others. So there is enough to go around. This isn't a conscious decision by any means, but it is something that we call resource partitioning. And if all birds wanted to eat one species of berries, there would not be enough to go around similarly to liver and onions and some of their populations would die out. And anything from little songbirds that are in those treetops to ducks in the water, they have different foraging food preferences, not even preferences, just foods that they actually eat. So outside of the obvious direct use of water, of bathing and drinking locations, different water features provide different feeding opportunities for different species. So if you look at this image on the far left, you have ducks. You have ducks that dive deep into the depths. You have some ducks like mallards that just stay on the surface and they have different resource partitioning that allows them to eat certain things so they can coexist. If you look at herons, you're not going to expect to see a heron swimming in the middle of a giant lake as you would with a common loon, but you might expect to see them near the shoreline. Similarly to knots, like the red knot that we've already talked about before, you have other species that are much shorter, you're just expecting to see them on the beaches. And so it's not only important to conserve a diversity of habitat from, you know, wetlands to forests to grasslands, but diversity even within the water features themselves can be really crucial in helping birds. And bringing this back to migration, Imagine if you walked from South America to Northern Canada in, let's say, a month or two. I would assume that you'd probably hope for great weather, a safe place to sleep, some free food, and some water. And so migration is already a really exhausting, dangerous journey. And we can help make it easier for these birds by ensuring that we're maintaining those clean water features, by conserving that diversity of water features for many species. But when you think about water birds, you might think about ducks like mallards or herons like great blue herons or swans. But what you might not think about are other species that really need water. This is a rusty blackbird. This is a species that has actually experienced population declines over 85% since the 1970s. And that's pretty bizarre to think about because the house that I'm sitting in right now is built in the 1970s. And so an 85% drop in population over that short amount of time is a little concerning. And rusty blackbirds, they actually breed in that northern boreal region, but they fly south in the fall to wetlands in the southeast. So we can actually watch their migration. So I'm gonna direct you to this map. If you look at areas on the map that are yellow, this is a lower relative abundance, um, lower number of birds, higher relative abundance is shown in purple on the map. If you look at week of the year, so January 4th, so rusty blackbirds are in the Southeast in January. And then as I play this, it'll go throughout time. So, if I play this around March, April, you can see them starting to make this migration in spring, 
They're breeding in that boreal region before they make that fall migratory trek back through Ontario to the southeast. And rusty blackbirds rely on wooded wetlands throughout their life cycle. So urban development, forestry, wetland conversion to agriculture, it does really limit their available habitat and there is not as many places left for them to go, which is why the boreal region as breeding habitat and all of the safe havens in their stopover throughout South and Central Ontario are really important for these birds and really important to maintain their populations. But there are so many other species that rely on water features, even if they aren't typically what you would think about as a water bird. Palm warblers, for example, on the top left. These beautiful songbirds with a rusty cap, um, kind of a yellow tan body, and they often bob their tail. They breed in the boreal region, but they actually prefer to live in areas near water. And this is also true during migration. Before I moved to our, our home now, I was living in Woodstock in southwestern Ontario. And in April and May last year, I was walking along a trail, a little river in a natural area, and a bunch of palm warblers just decided to migrate through that morning. And they were just sitting by the river on branches, foraging, looking for insects in the water. I was in Thunder Bay um, before COVID, so two Octobers ago. Um, and it was late in the fall. It was, I think, October, getting into November. And palm warblers should generally be gone by then. But there was just a palm warbler in Thunder Bay um, by a stream in a forest. And so they're just using these areas that we can help them use. Or you have tree swallows on the bottom left. They're not exclusively boreal breeders by any means. And you can essentially see tree swallows wherever you are in appropriate habitat across Canada but you can almost watch them dancing in the air as they fly over the surface of the water. Um, what about bald eagles, for example, these powerful birds of prey? They actually breed in forests next to, next to large bodies of water. So I have another question for everyone. This is a little bit more of a challenge, um, not just your preferences. I'm gonna play two songs. Which song do you think belongs to the bald eagle? So I'm just going to check that my sound is coming through. All right. Is this song the bald eagle? Or is this song the bald eagle? This is song two. So go ahead in the poll. Which song do you think belongs to the bald eagle? It's a little bit of a trick question. Maybe that'll help people. Um, <laughs> these powerful birds, you'd expect them to have a very intimidating call, a very something that you'd hear, you know, from the national bird of the US, right? Like this very amazing national bird. So that is also very interesting. We have a good split of polls. So the second more wimpy call, this call is actually the bald eagle. But I totally understand why people would say that the first one was a bald eagle. Often in TV shows, they will actually dub over the bald eagle with another species. And this song is actually the red-tailed hawk. And that's usually what they use when they show a bald eagle on TV. I guess they wanna make it seem more intimidating. Um, but I've actually seen a lot of juvenile bald eagles even throughout the winter. Again, look for them along shorelines near lakes as well. And then on the bottom right, you have common yellow throat. It's a warbler. They inhabit thick, dense vegetation, often near water. And whenever I go to a place with water, with thick vegetation, even a small pond, I basically just expect to hear them. And you can listen for them too. They have a pretty distinct song. It kind of sounds like an up and down slur that goes like, witchity, witchity, witchity. And it's just repeated. So I'll play it. But witchity, witchity, witchity. So 
So I guess my homework <laughs> for you all is just listen for that song in the spring, wherever you are, um, unless you're in extreme, extreme north, near bodies of water with dense vegetation. I can almost guarantee that you will hear a common yellow foot this year. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because you can help. You have a pretty unique opportunity, whether you own a property with a water feature, um, whether you live in an area with some, or maybe you're thinking of adding one to your home, you can help make this journey to and from that boreal region a lot safer and easier for thousands, thousands, billions of individuals, or even resident birds that keep us all company year round. You can experience their beauty while also maintaining an attractive outdoor space and conserve them at the same time. So if you remember this photo from earlier in the slideshow, this is where I live. We're very thankful that we're able to have some natural areas close by and having a water feature nearby was really important for us for mental health, but also because we love wildlife. And this is one of his photos of a great blue heron on our property. Um, but when I look at this picture, I am so grateful that this pond and stream wasn't converted to other land use. And of course, there's nothing wrong with industry or agriculture at all. We should be very, very thankful for that. But there are, of course, ways to strike a balance as with everything else. And when I look at this, I see a lot of lawn. I see a lot of lawn mowing, a lot of costly maintenance and time and not really a lot of wildlife habitat. So what am I personally going to do about this? So do you remember how we just talked about the common yellow throat and how it inhabits dense vegetation near water? Maybe uh, birds, I don't know why I said maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a good thing, but birds, they may choose specific habitat features to avoid detection from predators and also from protection from the elements. So to redu reduce their detectability and also increase their safety, you can provide shelter in the form of say planting some aquatic vegetation or planting some clusters of shrubs or even some dense ground cover. So this can allow for birds to more safely move through migration or forage and look for food, protect their territory, move in their home range, or even providing safe nesting and roosting habitat for birds throughout the year. So when I look at my home, I am excited to turn this into more of a wildlife habitat. We do have species like the great heron, mallards, belted kingfisher, but I'm looking forward to welcoming some more diversity to our home. I'm thinking about, you know, planting some shrubs, some aquatic vegetation along the shore, maybe some trees. If I think about the summer and I'm outside and reading a book by the water with some trees, that sounds a lot nicer to me than mowing the lawn for an hour. Um, maybe some wildflowers as well. And Maybe I'm thinking about some species, not just for the spring and summer, but maybe some that will hold seed heads or fruit into the fall and winter so I can welcome birds to my property year round. What I'm really talking about in this is gardening for birds. If you have a water feature, if you have a pond, if you back up onto a lake, or maybe you just want to include a small bird bath in your backyard, you could consider gardening with birds in mind. Try planting species that naturally occur in your region. Species that exist in Windsor area won't necessarily grow as well in Muskoka's. And so try planting species that work for your area and are more successful to grow, that the wildlife are more accustomed to. You could try planting ground cover, some shrubs, and also some tall trees to give you more structural diversity to give the birds shelter. Maybe some birds are nesting on the tops of the trees, but maybe they're actually foraging near the ground. And so providing them shelter from the ground up near those water features can really help provide a safer space for a variety of species. Having vegetation surrounding water bodies reduces lawn cutting, it reduces erosion since the roots will essentially make for stronger banks. This is also true for tall shorelines with bluffs or large banks as well. And I was excited to see on the Muskoka Watershed Council website, it promoted Watershed Canada's program, the Natural Edge program, which encourages individuals to kind of restore those natural shorelines, which is exactly in line with gardening for birds. The great thing about this is that you can really start small. You don't need to feel like you need to do these grand gestures of removing all of your exotic species that they might not even be invasive. Um, 
just slowly incorporating more native elements into the plan for your outdoor space can really be beneficial. And you don't even need a large water body to do this. You can do this by just planting some trees, maybe increasing forest cover. Maybe you are near an agricultural field and you want to plant some more grassland species. And so building up the native plant diversity around your pond is really what we recommend and what I'm excited to do as well. And I will be fully transparent. I don't know a ton about plants. Um, so if you're like me and you're thinking, that's great, but how do I even know what plants to plant? I'll let you in on a little secret that we're actually hoping to provide a resource that really focuses on gardening for birds and different plant selections tailored to your region. So I will just say, stay tuned, it's coming, stay tuned. And so, Overall, we know that by keeping wetlands, waterways, lakes, water bodies healthy by reducing pollution, maintaining those temperature gradients, ensuring that water bodies are entrained is important for humans, but also wildlife. And also things that I know you've probably heard about a million times, but safe boating practices, watch your speeds around common loons or other water birds, don't discard your fishing line, your plastics, your antifreeze, pesticides, etc. This can directly harm birds and other wildlife and it can lead to their mortality. And of course, always just checking our boats to make sure we're not transporting zebra mussels. Nobody likes getting cut on their feet by zebra mussels, at least I do not. And a couple other things to consider is participating in what's called citizen science project, because we're all citizens of the earth, like loon surveys. So the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey is essentially where families or lake property owners, or even if you just like visiting a lake a couple times a year, you can essentially take your recreation activities to another level by having active participation in science towards conservation. This survey has actually been going on since 1981 and it tracks common loon breeding and it monitors those chick and hatch survival. Essentially, if you just go to a lake once in June to see if there's actually loons there, again in July to see if the chicks hatch, and then one more time in August to see if they, the chicks actually survived, that's all that's required just to monitor these populations. And another option is the Marsh Monitoring Program. It's a wildlife monitoring program for coastal and also inland marshes. If you're confident in being able to identify your water birds and maybe even some amphibians, you can just help out by watching your marsh grow over time or even throughout the season and collect some data. Survey information really helps us track long-term trends in the species diversity. It guides management of those areas, conservation and restoration. And so it's kind of a win-win for both. And then lastly, I'll talk about if you're looking for more ways or if you know people who are more experienced with bird identification, you can check out breeding bird atlases. One is starting in Ontario this year and also Newfoundland. There has been others in Saskatchewan, Quebec, Manitoba, British Columbia. They've all had this in the past. Essentially, atlases is just a project that results in mapping the distribution and relative abundance of breeding birds over a province, so over all of Ontario. So feel free to reach out to me or just go to our website if you are interested. So those are kind of the general things that I would recommend to kind of keep the bird diversity at our water bodies thriving and ways that we can all be easily involved in their conservation. And I'll just quickly point out that I know there's a lot of bird pictures in this presentation. Um, I'm not expecting that everyone's a great bird ID. I don't know plants, you know, we all have our things. And so if you're interested in just trying to figure out what birds are on your property or even if you start gardening for birds and you see different species, maybe some unexpected species, there are a variety of tools you can use. I grew up using field guides from Peterson, there's Sibley, National Geographic, Stokes, Kaufman, there are so many. There's also some free apps, which is also a bonus, the Merlin app. Um, you can go to allaboutbirds.org and just kind of figure out how you learn and be patient with yourself. A couple other things, there's eBird, where if you're just on the boat in the summer or if you're taking a walk in your neighborhood and you see some birds, you can just log that information on eBird. It's a free app. You can go on the website and that just helps us track their abundance and their migration. And if you remember this example for the rusty blackbird, 
This is eBird data. So this is just data that was collected from bird watchers across the US and Canada, showing where they were at specific times of the year. And we can really just be a part of this, which helps in their conservation and their management. And it's just as simple as seeing a bird and recording it. And if you're not so much into birds, but maybe you're into plants or insects, iNaturalist is also a very similar tool and you can kind of do the same thing. So that's it for me. Thank you again for being willing to learn about how and why water features provide those crucial life-saving resources for birds, especially those making that long journey to the boreal region. The water bodies that we have on our property um, or in our neighborhoods, they are really, really great for us. They're also really, really great for birds. And gardening for birds doesn't mean we have to make our landscape super wild, even though I like that, but you can have an attractive space and it can also be good for birds. And as long as we just think about how do we provide food, water, and shelter for birds year round, then how that will help us keep them safe for years to come. Again, just check out these programs if you're interested, if you want to learn more about the boreal region, or if you want to learn how to identify some birds on their migration, you can go to our YouTube channel where I've done some webinars. But that's it. Thank you again for inviting me to speak today. Thank you for working through um, Zoom. I know Zoom fatigue can be a real concern. And so I appreciate you taking time to do this. Um, feel free to email me at nbarlow at birdscanada.org. And again, stay tuned for the Gardening for Birds resource. I will be using it and it will be coming soon, I promise.